Good afternoon. My name is John uh, March. I'm Director of Neurosciences Medicine at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and I'm going to be talking with you today about a very exciting time in neuroscience, particularly the neuroscience of psychiatric disorders, that is, the pivot to preemptive treatments in psychiatry. But first, there's the obligatory uh, disclosures. Um, I have relationships with a variety of uh, companies, uh, but the majority of my funding is either from the NIMH, uh, NIDA, uh, and uh, NARSED. Uh, all of this is available on the web at the address you see uh, on this slide, and I've done no promotional work uh, for about 15 uh, years now. So we're transforming medicine, moving to a new paradigm in which the emphasis will be um, as much on preemptive treatments as on our past uh, history of curative, uh, curative treatments. Um, at the beginning, we'll be focusing on uh, predictive markers so that we can develop uh, an understanding of psychiatric disorders as developmental uh, disorders uh, with a biological basis, uh, moved very rapidly um, to personalized uh, uh, treatments so that we can understand the predictors of illness for individual patients, and then move to preemptive treatments, first at the group level and ultimately uh, at the individual level over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And it's this process that I'd like to outline for you uh, going forward. What we'll do initially is focus on what is meant by preemptive treatments, and then talk about what I call the four pivots to preemptive interventions. The first of these, translational developmental neuroscience, is going to be the foundation by which we develop uh, new interventions, new intervention targets, uh, biomarkers and personalized medicine, which are fellow travelers with translational developmental neuroscience, that is, the fundamental biology provides the biomarkers and ultimately allows personalization. Uh, moving very rapidly then to novel interventions that target uh, uh, these biomarkers that, in fact, are evaluated with respect um, to surrogate endpoints that are either biomarker or biosignature driven, and ultimately moving treatments out of the laboratory and into early phase uh, clinical pharmacology. Some of that is actually, in fact, already happening, as I'll show you in a bit. Uh, we'll also talk about how we think about um, preemptive uh, trials in the context of prevention and all, uh, in comparative effectiveness research, which will dovetail very nicely uh, with this movement, movement toward uh, uh, preemptive um, intervention. Now, Tom Insel, the current director of the National Institutes of Mental Health, uh, has popularized the term uh, preemptive interventions, and he defines a preemptive approach uh, as reducing morbidity and mortality by intervening early before the full syndrome develops and realigning the trajectory of development so that the individual identified at risk has the greatest opportunity for the best outcome. This is very different from the traditional understanding of pre uh, prevention. What you see here um, is a IOM report uh, on preventing mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders among young people. The current and most uh, conventional and popular view of prevention um, is essentially community-based or individual-based risk factor uh, uh, management. Um, and in this model, uh, the IOM describes pre uh, prevention as involving a way of thinking that goes beyond the traditional disease model in which one waits for an illness to occur and then provides evidence-based um, treatment. We're going to stick today with evidence-based treatments administered uh, with a biological foundation um, based in uh, translational developmental neuroscience. And in this context, prevention requires a biologically-based theory of disease. And in this biologically-based theory of disease, we're now talking about trajectories of development or within development trajectories of illness. In that sense, time is integral to the model of prevention, not something to be gotten rid of um, by excluding the full spectrum of age or covariate out in the analysis. Its development is actually, um, is actually the foundation uh, of the uh, illness model. Um, we'll also require for prevention personalized predictive tools in the form of biomarkers or biosignatures, as I've said, um, and then novel interventions that prevent or forestall illness. In this cartoon slide, the doctor is saying to the patient, your illness doesn't cover the sniffles. Come back when it develops something more, into something more serious. Sniffles, in a sense, are a marker of the prodrome of an illness like, say, influenza or the common rhinovirus uh, cold. 
And when we think about the prodrome, we need to be very specific about what we're talking about. The prodrome is uh, characterized by premonitory manifestations of the disease. These are not a characteristic of the individual, for example, gender, or their environment, for example, um, chronic stress, or necessarily a causal agent of the disease, like a genetic um, vulnerability polymorphism. The prodrome may or may not continue to be manifest once the full disease appears, although it is likely, for example, say in schizophrenia, that that will indeed be the case, or in fact, sniffles, as we um, just saw. Prodromal symptoms may or may not manifest in different episodes. The course of the disease, for example, thinking about Alzheimer's, will look very different um, in patients um, at the beginning of the disease than at the end of the disease. Now, fortunately, developmental neuroscience has matured as a field um, uh, dramatically over the last several years. Most of what we know has been learned in the last five years, and much of what we know that uh, promises new and better interventions has been learned just in the last two or three years. There's a very nice article by um, Susan Anderson and, uh, and Carol Navalta published in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry that reviewed these new frontiers in developmental neuropharmacology. Um, and I highly recommend this article to you as providing a nice platform for understanding how we can intervene early, either before there are any signs of illness or during the illness programs. What they talk about is a systems-based approach to biological disease components. Um, at the top, we have endophenotypes, or intermediate phenotypes of uh, symptomatology, things like um, executive function, the various aspects of memory, um, affective information processing. These are information processes that run on um, uh, uh, neural uh, uh, circuits um, and can be assayed in um, a variety of fMRI or PET paradigms uh, uh, using um, uh, structural or functional uh, imaging technologies. Uh, these circuits at the synaptic level are um, in, uh, informed, uh, governed, uh, functional in, uh, with respect to neurotransmitter uh, systems. And each of these uh, pre- and postsynaptic neurons for a particular neurotransmitter um, has its own pharmacology with a variety of uh, signal uh, transduction cascades um, that then are uh, directed by um, gene transcription, epigenetic modification, and in the intermediate form, um, a variety of MR, mRNA um, uh, uh, subtypes. Um, so analyzing these together produces a systems biology and at any given level, or crossing two levels, provides us a nice way to understand the developmental aspects um, of the uh, uh, illness um, uh, program and uh, onset. Now, this is much clearer at this point in cancer than it is in neuroscience, although, as I'll show, the two have uh, quite a bit in common. This is a paper published in Science a couple of years ago um, looking at the genomic landscape of human breast and colorectal uh, cancers. And what you see here on the green uh, graphic is a bunch of large peaks called mountains and a variety of smaller uh, peaks called hills. Uh, the mountains are genetic variants that are held in common across patients who have uh, a particular uh, cancer phenotype. Uh, these are common uh, uh, variants that are um, required for the onset of the illness. The hills, on the other hand, the small peaks, uh, are unique variants, rare variants or less common variants, um, uh, each of which is also required for a particular patient to develop the illness, um, but may not all be present um, across uh, large numbers of patients. It's this combination of rare variants and a few select um, uh, tumor markers uh, uh, that, um, that produce vulnerability to cancer. And this picture will actually change uh, with cancer progression. So the pattern may be somewhat different uh, for a cancer um, at diagnosis as it is uh, than it is uh, once that cancer has become resistant to a particular form of, uh, of chemotherapy. Now, there's a fair bit of overlap between the biology of cancer and um, mental illness. Um, one might imagine that cancer cells um, uh, do a variety of things that normal cells are not supposed to. They um, divide. Uh, uh, they move around. They set up housekeeping in places where they're um, not supposed to be, and they cause all man manner of uh, difficulty um, when they get there. Um, most cells um, are um, prohibited from doing the things that cancer cells do, but not neurons. Um, neurons um, can divide neurogenesis. Um, can move around, um, uh, 
uh, through uh, uh, axonal and neuronal migration. Um, we'll set up housekeeping, uh, processes of um, uh, synaptic plasticity, um, and uh, 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 provide um, augmented function um, at the point that they become themselves uh, functional. So it turns out in epidemiologic investigations that apart from the tobacco cancers, most patients with mental illness uh, are less vulnerable to developing cancer, probably because the gene variants that protect against cancer um, also inhibit these normal processes of neuronal and synaptic plasticity. And when we look at the genetics of cancer and mental illness, we do see some very interesting overlaps. For example, here at the AKT mTOR pathway, there are a variety of predictive and pharmacodynamic uh, markers that overlap um, between cancer uh, vulnerability factors uh, or, um, or uh, disease factors uh, and, uh, and schizophrenia by bipolar disorder, the disorders that are associated with um, cognitive um, dysfunction. Now, with that as the background for understanding what, pre, uh, what constitutes a preemptive treatment, let's talk about translational developmental neuroscience. We know um, from epidemiologic studies that 75% um, that, uh, of, um, of persons with mental illness will have the onset of their disorder before the age of 24, 50% before the age of 14. So from the epidemiologic evidence, we know that these are disorders of young people, that mental illness um, is essentially a set of neurodevelopmental um, disorders. We also know it takes a very long time um, to first treatment for these disorders. So we have, with our current treatments, already lost the ability to intervene <clears throat> at the prodromal um, stage of the disorder. We're way out from uh, illness uh, uh, trajectory when we begin, um, when we get, begin treating, which uh, is a little bit analogous, uh, for example, to treating someone for the first time after they've had uh, their fifth heart attack um, or their first or second stroke. We also know that there's a developmental progression for the onset of mental disorders. In this slide, you can see that um, you have ADHD and autism onsetting early, followed by antisocial behavior, conduct disorder, depression, and anxiety, followed by OCD, although OCD also has an early onset form that's comorbid with tick disorders, and ADHD, drug abuse and eating disorders in the early teenage years, followed by the psychotic disorders and social phobia. Um, so there's a developmental progression of these illnesses, which implies that there's something about the developmental trajectory on a biological basis um, that is uh, predictive or uh, poses a vulnerability um, factor uh, for the onset of these, um, for these illnesses. In a lovely article in uh, Frontiers in Psychiatry, <clears throat> um, uh, written by uh, Jane Costello, uh, entitled Grand Challenges in Child and Neurodevelopmental um, Psychiatry, uh, Jane, Jane puts the challenge to us this way. Prevention and development are intimately intertwined. Only when we understand the developmental course of a symptom or a disorder can we have a solid scientific underpinning for prevention. And in the key sentence, a well-defined prevention trial will implicitly or explicitly test a developmental theory of disease. And this essentially is the foundation for intervention based on a developmental model of, of psychiatric illness um, that is based in translational developmental neuroscience. Looked at here in terms of this uh, graphic, which was developed as part of a council work group on translational developmental neuroscience that I co-chaired with Pat Levitt and we'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, we have fetal development um, at the left on the y-axis out through age 18. Uh, 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 so this is the developmental or time dimension. And we have changes. Um, uh, during these periods of development on the uh, y-axis. And what you see here uh, 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 is a, uh, uh, a normal uh, development at uh, some point until there's a, um, uh, uh, an interruption of these normal developmental processes. This might be, for example, a gene by environmental interaction between um, some sort of uh, stress and uh, a BDNF uh, polymorphism. This interaction um, then can produce um, uh, an immediate uh, flowing off of the developmental trajectory until at some point it comes to notice um, and a diagnosis is made. Or there can be a sleeper effect, a period of time, um, a period of time uh, where there is no illness. Only, for example, during puberty um, would depression emerge, even though the um, gene-by-environment interaction that posed the vulnerability factor 
this being a sensitive period, uh, uh, was uh, 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 in place uh, some 10 years um, earlier. Either way, at this point, our job is to intervene in this process with an evidence-based treatment and to return the child to a normal or typical developmental trajectory. Ideally, we'd like to make this intervention in the prodrome, that is, before the child, in fact, became ill, um, or even better, uh, uh, at the point of, um, of vulnerability before there was um, any in interference with development at all. Uh, the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry um, has, uh, 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 in 2010 and 2011, published issues uh, which are devoted to this. Uh, the 2010 uh, issue was um, uh, all about uh, prodromal, uh, uh, understanding the prodrome for mental illness, um, and the current 2011 uh, issue published um, just, uh, <coughs> uh, just this month uh, that um, uh, 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 focuses on um, developmental neuroscience uh, coming of age. And Jim Leckman and I wrote the uh, editorial for this, so I've had a chance to read the articles, and they are really quite powerful expressions of the progress made um, in our field um, to this point and well worth um, uh, uh, close uh, reading. Now, we know that um, from this line of research that mental disorders are brain disorders. This is a, uh, a work from... Um, from uh, Judy Rapoport and Jay Geed's group, uh, Phil Shaw is the first author, uh, showing that ADHD, in fact, is a delay in cortical uh, maturation, at least some aspects of, of, uh, of, of ADHD. Um, and you can see both in the graphs and in the pictures um, that there's a, a slowing of cortical maturation by about four years um, uh, that is expressed early on uh, in the um, growth and development of a child with ADHD relative uh, to uh, normal controls. Uh, schizophrenia, on the other hand, um, uh, rather than a cortical lag, is probably a disorder of excessive uh, cortical remodeling. And you see for both boys, boys and girls in this slide also um, from Judy's group, uh, the difference between uh, normal development and, um, and uh, gray matter loss in uh, patients with schizophrenia where uh, uh, red and the lighter reddish colors are, um, are indexes of gray matter loss um, in patients who are uh, moving from the prodrome into the full, um, into the full uh, uh, illness. Uh, over uh, several years of, uh, of time. This is a quite striking uh, finding and, and illustrates beautifully uh, the um, importance of uh, preemptive uh, interventions as compared to treating the disease uh, once it, um, it has uh, emerged. Now, thinking still about the uh, prodrome in uh, schizophrenia, uh, what you see here uh, in this slide in the red line is the loss of function that occurs in the premorbid and prodromal periods um, uh, and uh, is maintained in the uh, progressive uh, uh, portion of the, uh, of the illness. That's the red line uh, beginning at the top and extending downward. Um, and the pattern of psychosis, which begins in the prodromal period, well after the onset of functional um, decline, um, and uh, 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 tends in repeated psychotic episodes uh, to be associated with further um, declines in function. Uh, typically, uh, we intervene in the first um, psychotic episode, um, but that does not delay the course of the uh, illness. There is some evidence that if you intervene and maintain uh, interventions with both drug and psychosocial interventions uh, at the first step of SOD, you can return patients to normal and retain uh, remission in some uh, fragment of patients, but in general, uh, with a second or third episode, uh, the course for schizophrenia is set, and there's not much uh, we can do about it. Again, analogous to treating patients who've had multiple heart attacks uh, or strokes. Um, now, you can see the treatment intervention on this slide during the progressive phase of the illness. What if we were to shift that a treatment intervention into the program before the first a psychotic episode occurs? And you can see in the dash red line that function then recovers um, and, um, and psychotic symptoms stay at a relatively low ebb uh, so that the patient never develops uh, the formal illness. If we were able to intervene even earlier in the premorbid uh, phase of the illness, it would likely be um, even more Effective. This is a paper by uh, Jeff Lieberman and colleagues in CNS Spectrums uh, talking about the neuroprotection model for intervening in schizophrenia. Again, um, a very good read. Now, we know that there are a variety of susceptibility genes on both um, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms um, and particular for rare variants, copy number variations. And these are some of the candidates that are illustrated on this slide. This is by no means an ex exhaustive list as this slide is a already a couple of years old. There are many more um, candidate genes um, at, this, uh, at this point. 
Um, but be that as it may, we know that these disorders um, have a, uh, a genetic uh, vulnerability. And what's important about this is not that any of these particular genetic markers will then uh, make proteins that are, um, that are uh, targets for intervention, but that, in fact, they illustrate um, the driver pathways, the pathways by which uh, uh, psychiatric uh, disorders um, uh, 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 develop, a little like what you might think BRAC1 or 2, for example, uh, that model has done for, um, for breast cancer. They also open up pathways to drug development. So in the old model on the left, um, we moved from clinical observation to uh, studies of mechanism of action, usually uh, for amine uh, neurotransmitters in our uh, current models, uh, animal studies, and ultimately to clinical trials. It has been said that there's been no interesting developments in um, psychiatric drug development um, since chlorpromazine um, because all of our antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics, are essentially modifications of that basic uh, chlorpromazine um, uh, molecule. Modern dis uh, drug discovery, on the other hand, proceeds from uh, genetics, uh, which tell us the pathways by which uh, uh, development is interrupted at the um, uh, uh, synaptic and signal transduction uh, levels. Uh, 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 with a firm understanding of molecular pathophysiology, um, we can identify the points of leverage or uh, targets for um, intervention um, using high throughput small molecule screening and medicinal chemistry to uh, optimize a lead um, uh, mo uh, molecule. We can then go through the variety of uh, preclinical um, requirements, uh, toxicology, uh, uh, manuf uh, manufacturing, and so on that are required to get an IND and move into the clinical trial sequence, uh, ultimately, hopefully, um, bringing drugs um, to market that benefit uh, patients. So it's a very different model uh, for drug development that's widely used in other areas of medicine, but it's just beginning um, to make its way um, into psychiatry. If you look at this from the point of view of developmental disorders, this is a slide um, uh, adapted from uh, uh, one that uh, Tom Insel adapted from Mark Baer. Uh, uh, it looks like this. You begin with a developmental disorder, um, uh, understand the um, uh, genetics of the uh, disorder, uh, allowing us to um, develop a deeper understanding of the molecular uh, pathophysiology by introducing these gene variants alone or in combination into um, uh, model uh, organi organisms, mice, uh, flies, uh, a variety of, um, of cell-based uh, models, um, uh, which then lets us look at um, cellular uh, uh, pathology, uh, 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 develop uh, targets uh, for treatment, and move through that sequence that I just uh, told you about uh, on the way to um, small molecule therapeutics or large molecule therapeutics, uh, so-called um, biologics, if that's what's uh, required. Uh, for example, for accessing a signal transduction pathway, and ultimately then to um, treat the developmental disorder that's under study. Now, there's a very nice example of this, which has actually progressed uh, using um, uh, NIH and um, uh, 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 philanthropy model, um, <coughs> uh, angel philanthropy, um, uh, with uh, seaside therapeutics, which is developing um, treatments for fragile X syndrome um, and also um, for um, autism. Uh, and as you know, fragile X is an X-linked uh, syndrome in which uh, patients who are afflicted um, make um, uh, uh, insufficient amounts of the fragile X nodal retardation protein, which acts as a break um, on the signal, uh, in the signal transduction pathways uh, for a glutaminergic neural transmission to the AMPA receptor. Um, and as a result, the receptor trafficking for the AMPA receptor um, is broken with receptors at the postsynaptic neuron uh, internalized, resulting in poor, uh, poorly functioning misshapen neurons. You can see that progression in the right-hand slide from a big, fat, happy neuron with lots of receptors on the postsynaptic neuron um, to that little skinny uh, neuron on the right, which is non-functional um, and in which the receptor biology is um, completely disrupted. Um, by intervening um, with a MGLUR5 antagonist um, at the uh, postsynaptic uh, receptor, um, one essentially replaces the fMR prebake and in animal models, fly models, um, these neurons uh, normalize and function returns to normal. Uh, what's really exciting about this is that these molecules are now moving uh, through phase one on to uh, phase 2A trials with adult 
uh, sufferers from Fragile X, and we will have our first evidence of whether they're um, effective or not uh, sometime in the next year or year and a half. This is a very exciting development, and, um, and uh, uh, in uh, common parlance, it's often seen now as the poster child for mes mechanistic drug development um, for psychiatric syndromes. Now, it's not only psychotherapy that's going to benefit from these new insights in translational developmental neuroscience. Uh, there's something called attention bias modification training, um, uh, which uses a modification of the dot, dot probe task, um, uh, 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 a probe task in fMRI paradigms, um, looking at um, the ability to um, uh, shift attention depending on the nature of the uh, stimuli. So one would ordinarily linger over a threat cue and have difficulty uh, shifting attention uh, when a, a subsequent cue was uh, presented. You can modify the dot probe task so that it um, reinforces attending to neutral cues over threat cues. And if you do this um, over um, 8 to 12 weeks, um, you, uh, uh, without any form of psychotherapy or drug treatment, um, develop a uh, improvement in symptoms uh, which approximates um, uh, what you would get from um, uh, uh, corresponding cognitive behavior therapy or medication management. And in this meta-analysis in bi biological psychiatry at the end of last year by Danny Pine, um, you can see looking at a variety of these studies that most of the uh, 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 odds ratios are slightly to the right of one. And in fact, you can't read it, but the x-axis is effect sizes and the effect sizes overall uh, for these treatments are around 0.6. Uh, so a moderate uh, effect uh, from uh, modifying the uh, threat bias, this particular information process which is active in anxiety disorders uh, um, at the level of information processing and neural circuitry uh, rather than thinking about it from a behavioral symptomatic um, point of view. Now imagine that you take this same process and you um, use uh, quantitative electroencephalography, uh, develop a um, uh, unique individual um, signature for on-task or uh, off-task um, using QEG methods and you perform this same sort of task but using an EEG driver uh, rather than, um, rather than um, simple uh, hits and misses uh, on a, um, on a uh, probe task. Uh, it's likely to become even more uh, effective, and these models are now um, being developed for ADHD, for driving wheelchairs, uh, for uh, amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. And I think this is um, likely to become um, an exciting form of... Uh, non-pharmacologic intervention um, uh, that may, in fact, at some point re replace the kind of therapist intervention, uh, driven interventions that we use uh, today, um, or at least be used in combination uh, with them and with uh, pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy in this model, um, as you might expect, from the decycloserine augmenting CBT study, uh, functions as a learning enhancer, that is, as a nootropic. So there are many ways these um, these pathways for intervention that have been developed within a translational developmental or science framework uh, can be used alone and in combination to improve patient outcomes. Now, all of this um, and more is put together in a National Advisory Mental Health Council work group um, on neural development um, that um, I mentioned before that I co-chaired, had the good fortune of co-chairing with um, Pat, uh, uh, Pat Levitt. This was done in 2008. And it set the stage for the uh, NIMH to make this pivot um, toward uh, translational developmental neuroscience. And if you look at the quality of the applications and the portion of the NIMH portfolio uh, devoted to these efforts, you can see um, the impact uh, of this line of research and of the Council Workgroup report. And I think um, from watching the NIMH and understanding where the science is taking the field, that we're only going to see uh, more and more emphasis um, on uh, developmental trajectory-based um, illnesses and less and less emphasis um, on uh, treatments for adults um, that are treated as uh, static um, with, respect to, um, with respect to development. Now, if we think about personalization, um, what we talk about um, in this context from a biological point of view um, is biomarkers and biosignatures. Um, the U.S. Congress defines personalized medicine as the application of genomic and molecular data to better target the delivery of health care, facilitate the discovery and clinical testing of new products, and help determine a person's predisposition to a particular disease or condition. So from a regulatory or FDA uh, point of view, um, uh, uh, understanding disease 
um, its diagnosis or its prognosis would be a diagnostic and understanding um, which people will benefit or be harmed by a particular treatment um, is com concerned, uh, uh, is, uh, is called a companion um, uh, uh, diagnostic. And both these forms of personalization um, are, um, uh, are coming to the fore uh, in our understanding of how to develop um, medications uh, for patients with psychiatric illness. Now, a biomarker, this is the FDA definition, a biomarker is a characteristic that's subjectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to a therapy intervention. Again, um, a diagnostic or a companion diagnostic. Um, uh, a biosignature is simply an optimized biomarker panel. So biomarkers, uh, by example, would be a um, single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, whereas a biosignature might be a set of polymorphisms um, chained um, uh, 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 together. Now, we talk these days about omics uh, platforms. That's genetics, genomics, uh, epigenetics, transcriptomics, or uh, the various forms of messenger um, RNA, uh, the proteome or proteomics, uh, and the metabolome or metabolomic. If you put all of these uh, together, you get what's called uh, systems in the biology. And a biomarker or biosignature can operate um, at any one of these levels, for example, a proteomic biosignature for depression, um, or can cross levels um, a genetic uh, proteomic uh, uh, biosignature panel um, for vulnerability to depression or for predicting early response to treatment. Um, now, when we think about the uh, use of these in developmental disorders, one really nice model is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a developmental disorder um, that actually begins early in life. This is, again, work from uh, Judy Rapoport's uh, 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 group with uh, Jay Geed and other uh, colleagues looking at the entorhinal uh, cortex, uh, which is uh, um, uh, essentially uh, it's an associational uh, 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 set of loop circuits that um, process uh, sensory input on the way to the um, and on the way to the hippocampus. And in persons who have the APOE uh, risk gene for Alzheimer's disease, um, either um, uh, uh, a single dose or a double dose of this uh, risk factor, uh, you see thinning of the entorhinal cortex um, in teenagers. So here, as we talked before, is a 50-year sleeper effect, um, which op offers opportunity to intervene during the proromal stage of, uh, excuse me, in the, in the um, symptom-free stage of the illness rather even than the programmal stage, which is uh, mild cognitive imp uh, impairment. And this uh, is the holy grail uh, for um, Alzheimer's uh, treatment. Now, now, in the Alzheimer's field, there have been uh, tremendous advancements just over the last couple of years uh, looking at uh, MRI, PET, and CSF um, bi biomarkers. Um, these are just a couple of papers that have developed uh, 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 biomarker by signature panels um, that have good predictive validity both for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease um, and also understanding um, uh, who responds uh, to treatments for um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I think it would behoove all of us who work in early onset neurodevelopmental disorders to pay um, close attention to the Alzheimer's world, uh, the Alzheimer's space, because it um, in many ways is the closest thing to a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder that we have um, as a model illness uh, for thinking about our early onset uh, psychiatric um, disorders. Now, the biomarker approach, um, uh, as I pointed out before, um, can work when there are no signs or symptoms uh, of a disease, uh, uh, can work to help identify causes uh, 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 of disease, and in fact, a biomarker may not be causal, um, or when there's a cause known um, uh, to make a diagnosis or to understand um, who should get a particular intervention or um, should never get a particular um, intervention because of uh, the possibility of adverse um, events. Um, in that context, the uh, uh, shift um, toward uh, biomarkers, which evolved directly from target identification um, and understanding the basic biology of the, of the pathways, the driver pathways, uh, which are, um, which are um, uh, off trajectory uh, for uh, mental illness, um, are key to efficient drug development using um, uh, the uh, FDA as the um, exemplar. Uh, the uh, FDA points out that biomarkers are the foundation of evidence-based medicine who should be treated uh, how and with what. So, for example, the EKG um, is a biomarker for, um, for myocardial infarction. 
um, uh, hypertension um, uh, uh, measured with a sphygmomanometer or diabetes measured with a uh, blood glucose or a uh, hemoglobin A1C are uh, prodromal um, biomarkers uh, uh, that are risk factors uh, for coronary artery um, disease. Absent new markers, advances in more targeted therapy will be limited and treatment will remain uh, largely empirical as it is with our current generation treatments. It's imperative that biomarker development be accelerated along with therapeutics. And in fact, if you look at what's happening, um, uh, uh, we're beginning to see this uh, certainly in other areas, for example, genomic-driven um, cancer chemotherapy um, and also now um, in Alzheimer's disease. So one begins with retrospective studies, existing databases, uh, looking for biomarkers uh, using uh, 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 individual biomarkers or biosignatures, pathway analysis, and so on. Um, these biomarkers are then developed as training sets and finally moved into phase one, two trials, um, often in context um, of a drug development uh, program. So if one has a new drug, hitting a target, that target itself becomes a surrogate biomarker and that can be used at phase two to index uh, uh, treatment and finally then moved into phase three um, efficacy trials leading to um, commercial um, launch. The commercial launch will not only include the drug, um, but if the drug is aimed at a particular subset of disorders identified by a biomarker or by a signature panel, it will include the companion diagnostic or even di a di diagnostic test uh, that will then um, also accompany uh, the introduction uh, of the new uh, drug. And one can see this in, um, in cancer chemotherapy with things like the mammoth chip, um, which is used now to guide uh, breast cancer chemotherapy. Now, thinking about biomarkers in personalized medicine brings us to novel interventions in early phase clinical pharmacology. What we're used to in psychiatry with studies of current drugs is largely um, phase three trials and post-marketing um, uh, studies usually develop for marketing reasons um, or to develop new indications. Um, um, these trials are actually quite different um, than early phase uh, clinical uh, pharmacology um, um, and in fact are um, going away uh, pretty much uh, in uh, large and small uh, pharma uh, at this point in time. Um, so this is the process of drug development. I've mentioned it before, one begins with um, Five to 10,000 uh, molecules in preclinical drug development identify one moves uh, from uh, target identification uh, through preclinical development. That 10,000 uh, becomes about 250. Um, and five to 10 of those will make it um, to phase one. At phase two, um, there'll be three to five that are successful. Um, at, um, uh, so that two to three go to phase, um, phase three. And about one of those uh, will end up getting regulatory approval. And that whole process takes anywhere um, from 12 uh, to, um, to, to 20 years. So it's a very cumbersome, uh, uh, painstaking, um, and costly um, enterprise to bring a drug to market. And in fact, the estimates are, as shown in this slide, um, that it's about $1.8 million um, to, to bring a, a drug to market in 2010 as compared to $100 million um, in 1979. And these are, in fact, real dollar costs. Now, despite the uh, a dramatic increase in R&D uh, spending, topping um, $50 million if you include the NIH spending in the mix, uh, the number of new drug appro approvals across therapeutic areas um, has declined considerably uh, over this uh, period of time. So R&D spending on the left, new drug approvals on the right. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that greater investment is producing less and less uh, return. And that's particularly true for our mechanistically novel new medical um, entities. Uh, if you look here um, uh, 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 at the um, uh, number of new um, uh, approvals for novel um, uh, compounds, uh, you can see that there wasn't all that much going on in the 50s. There was a lot not shown um, in the decade of the uh, 60s, 70s, um, and, uh, uh, and 80s. Uh, uh, but in present uh, terms, very little um, going on uh, for depression and schizophrenia. That's the dark blue and orange uh, bars. We're back to the 1950s level, whereas in heart disease, uh, there were um, uh, over uh, uh, this period of uh, time, 14 new novel medical ent entities uh, uh, developed uh, for cardiovascular um, illness just over the last um, several years. Um, so something's going on in neuroscience um, which, is, uh, which is quite striking. It has caused um, many companies um, to pull out of this space until it matures. Um, 
uh, in particular through this process of translation of developmental uh, neuroscience. So Glaxo's pulled out, um, uh, Sanofi Avenis has pulled out, Al uh, AstraZeneca has pulled out except for Alzheimer's disease, um, and a variety of companies have scaled back uh, their neuroscience uh, drug development pipeline. What this means, given that there are about 1,400 um, companies in the neuroscience space, is that most of the action is in biotech and small pharma, which is exactly what you'd expect if you were translating uh, from academic and small company research laboratories um, into this uh, preclinical drug development process uh, for uh, new small or large molecules that will then move um, into phase one over the next uh, four to five years, at which time everybody expects the large companies will jump back in, um, either by in-licensing um, compounds or um, buying these companies or partnering with them um, uh, in the future. Now, Steve Paul uh, wrote a very nice article in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery um, talking about how uh, 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 the pharmaceutical industry's grand challenge is to weed through this uh, large number of small molecules which will be moving through the pipeline to identify those at um, phase 2A and 2B um, which have a high probability of success at phase three so that the industry's resources um, can be spent uh, um, uh, wisely. Uh, what you see here in this slide from Steve's uh, article, in the top row is the traditional form of drug development. It's a little hard to see, but the take home message um, is that most of the money is spent at uh, phase uh, three and later at phase four. And what Steve proposed is to shift these resources to proof of concept. Um, so using a quick win, quick fail model with very high quality proof of concept trials, um, one promotes compounds um, that are likely to um, reach commercial, uh, commercialization. And because these are novel medical entities that have to satisfy not only the FDA but payers, that is, they have to be um, better in some way than the currently available medications um, uh, will be of considerable benefit uh, to patients. Now, much of this will take place in um, academic industry NIH partnerships. I work at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, which is an academic research organization, uh, an ARO. Um, we have essentially all the capabilities of a commercial uh, research organization, uh, but with an academic mission to develop and share knowledge that improves the care of patients around the world through innovative clinical research. Um, uh, we are a, um, uh, a, a phase one through uh, four uh, uh, shot conducting trials in neurosciences medicine uh, as well as cardiology, oncology, IDGI, and 27 uh, total therapeutic um, areas. Uh, um, uh, uh, within the academic uh, framework, industry is now making um, significant partnerships uh, with academic uh, laboratories and academic um, medical centers. Uh, and a lot of this early phase um, preclinical and um, phase one, two uh, work that's being done bringing new medical entities um, to uh, phase uh, three is being done using NIH funding or co-funding uh, with the NIMH uh, academic health centers and, um, and with uh, industry. Uh, foundations, for example, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation or the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation are also playing a significant role in intervention development in a not-for-profit space um, which brings uh, the foundation together with uh, academia, industry, um, and the uh, institutes. Um, and this, um, uh, what Steve would call a functionally integrated uh, uh, network partnership model, um, extends now well beyond companies to include these other um, sources. And it will be a great challenge um, to all of us to figure out how to work together uh, for the benefit of patients as we uh, move uh, forward. Um, this is just one of the topics um, uh, that was addressed in a, another council work group uh, published in 2010 called From Discovery to Cure um, that I co-chaired uh, co with, um, uh, with David Lewis. Uh, recognizing the pivot to translational um, developmental neuroscience, uh, the pivot to personalized medicine in the form of biomarkers and biosignatures, um, the need to move um, uh, new treatments um, uh, rapidly through the drug development uh, process, that is to pivot to early phase uh, clinical pharmacology, um, and to think um, critically about uh, how we'll do uh, prevention or preemption trials um, in the future when the time comes, and also how we can um, uh, do studies that are necessary with current generation treatments. Um, uh, the um, uh, council put together um, essentially a way of operationalizing the NIMH's strategic aim three, that is to develop new and better interventions for patients 
uh, with mental illness. And I won't go into detail uh, what's in the council report, but along with the earlier one on uh, developmental neuroscience, um, it's imperative reading for uh, anyone who wants to understand and where the NIMH is, um, is headed. Now, the NIH is on this same track. This is a New York Times article um, on, the, um, uh, on in, uh, improving the pace of uh, drug uh, discovery and, um, and um, uh, uh, drug development uh, through the National um, Center on um, Advancing um, Translational uh, Science, or NCATS. Uh, which is the newest of the um, NIH uh, institutes that will bring together the um, CTSAs, again, academia, um, uh, uh, something called the Cures Acceleration Network, uh, which is essentially a, a, a phase 1-2A um, program and a variety of NIH initiatives on the roadmap like molecular libraries um, uh, and uh, trend and raid um, so that the NIH can participate in conjunction with other organizations in this drug development uh, process, all aimed at um, speeding um, new interventions um, to patients. Now, uh, having um, reached this uh, uh, point, let's think a little bit about um, what will happen once we move um, uh, into a world of uh, preventive interventions, either um, before there are any signs of illness uh, or during the illness programs, the um, place that we now see, for example, um, in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So here, it's important to make a distinction between explanatory and pragmatic trials. Some trials ask whether an intervention can work under tightly controlled ideal conditions. We call these explanatory or efficacy trials, and they're all aimed at signal detection um, um, and at understanding mechanism by which treatments work their magic. And they emphasize protection of internal validity. Other trials ask whether an intervention works under usual conditions, that is, real doctors, real patients, real clinical settings, um, that is uh, using these, um, these medications in, uh, in contexts where they're actually used in practice. And we call these pragmatic or effectiveness trials. And here, um, uh, external validity um, is, a, uh, is a premium. That is, the noise, which would be bad for an explanatory trial, is actually part of the outcome in a fully um, pragmatic uh, trial. Um, it's true, as I'll show you, that the um, kinds of uh, features that are required for a pragmatic trial, that is large sample sizes, um, simple uh, protocols, are also going to be required for prevention trials, uh, given that these, um, these outcomes are quite rare um, in the populations um, that we'll be um, studying. Now, there's a very nice um, uh, panel statement, an NIH consensus development conference, illustrating how this process of moving um, from early identification into prodromal-based interventions uh, should happen in Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, this was published just this past year, and I encourage you, uh, again, to take a look at it um, for an understanding of how we might intervene early in neurodevelopmental illnesses. These models have been around for a very long time in cardiology. In fact, it's almost impossible to get a new drug or indication approved in cardiology without a large um, pragmatic trial. This is a paper by Dave Demetz and Rob uh, Califf published last year in Circulation. Um, that illustrates the models for doing large prevention trials um, in cardiology, uh, beginning with a disease using uh, some sort of uh, surrogate uh, uh, endpoint uh, in earlier phase trials to develop interventions and then moving ultimately to a large pragmatic trial. These trials, what are um, uh, often called mega trials, will have anywhere between 10,000 um, and 40,000 uh, patients. And you can imagine these are global trials. They're very simple. They have to take place in doctor's offices because there's no other possible way to do these studies. Um, and because they have very large sample sizes, they offer uh, all kinds of opportunities for um, uh, segmenting patients into those who respond and those uh, who don't or those who are harmed um, by, these, uh, by, these, um, by these trials. Now, that brings us to comparative effectiveness research, which is the generation and synthesis of evidence that compares the benefits and harms of alternative methods to prevent, diagnose, treat, and monitor a clinical condition or to improve the delivery of care. This is basically running uh, two treatments um, that are similar uh, and trying to identify which patients will do better with one treatment as compared um, to another. First in stratified medicine, looking at subgroups, but ultimately in per uh, personalized medicine, that is, being able to make predictions at the individual, um, uh, individual uh, patient level. 
Um, the purpose of all this is to help decision makers make informed decisions that will improve health care at the individual and population levels. Now, the Institute of Medicine has suggested what the priority areas ought to be um, for comparative effectiveness uh, 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 research. You can find these on the uh, HRQ, Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research website, um, uh, which um, will work with the new Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, um, to drive this CER agenda um, uh, going um, forward. And you can see here, or perhaps you um, can't, that neurologic and psychiatric disorders um, uh, are right up at the top of this, uh, right up at the top of this list, primarily because they cause enormous amount of distress, uh, functional impairment, and have, um, for uh, neurosciences medicine, uh, aggregated, um, not counting stroke, the single largest uh, economic in, uh, impact of any group of disorders uh, that we um, deal with. Now, uh, comparative effectiveness research includes data mining studies, observational studies, pragmatic or practical clinical trials, um, and systematic reviews. And if you go back to that slide I showed earlier on, on biomarkers and think to using uh, retrospective analyses of existing data sets for biomarker identification, you begin to get the idea of what a data mine or observational study uh, might allow us with respect to target identification or looking for predictive biomarkers. There are a variety of things one can do besides this on a practical tr uh, clinical trials network. Um, <clears throat> uh, that is randomized controlled um, or, or pragmatic trials. Uh, one can look at inception cohorts, active comparators, treatment addition or withdrawal trials, uh, dynamic treatment regimes, um, adaptive designs, population PK studies, stratifying um, on subgroup, uh, traditionally excluded or rare populations, and um, as I've emphasized, biomarker and biosignature identification um, and, uh, and, and validation. So one, once one has um, novel interventions that have moved through phase, uh, uh, phase three, uh, pragmatic trials are useful to help understand how these treatments should be used clinically and to develop uh, algorithms for guiding um, subgroup or personalized um, uh, 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 interventions. When we move to preemption trials, uh, these pragmatic trials will be the way that these trials are conducted at phase three um, and beyond. Now, one of the really nice things is with a very large sample size, uh, the standard error of the mean, this is now about 1,000, which is why Gallup polls are roughly at sample sizes of 1,000, um, uh, is the, um, uh, is the uh, division of the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Um, once that hits 1,000, um, the standard of, of the study becomes a, uh, a reasonable estimator of the population mean. Um, so a very large trial is actually going to be much more reliable um, than a meta-analysis of a, a number of smaller trials. It also, with all of this power, allows us, as I pointed out before, um, to identify subgroups. And from that same circulation paper by Demetz and Caleb, uh, this is a um, slide of uh, um, all of the, um, uh, uh, one of the statin uh, uh, trials uh, uh, looking at uh, subgroups. And two of these, the um, uh, resting, uh, fasting blood sugar um, and blood pressure um, are, um, are biomarkers. And you can see that with respect to reducing the incidence of sub subsequent um, heart attack um, or stroke, a cardiovascular event, uh, all of the uh, 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 statin trials on the left um, are better than placebo, irrespective of whether you have any of these um, uh, subgroup um, markers uh, or not. Uh, and, um, uh, and the same thing is true if you look at them um, in the aggregate. Um, in that context, it is crystal clear that comparative effectiveness research um, does not threaten personalized medicine. Very nice paper on this by Alan Garber and Sean Tunis in the New England Journal um, in 2009. In fact, one could argue um, that in order to identify uh, both hills and mountains, um, common variants and, um, and rare uh, variants, and to use these in prediction models for um, understanding diagnostics and companion diagnostics for these new interventions, uh, that in fact um, one has to capitalize on the infrastructure for comparative effectiveness research, particularly the pragmatic trials infrastructure, in order to do um, the phase three and four trials that are going to be required to move these drugs into clinical practice. What this will allow us to do, um, if we can develop a technology platform, is to in fact move into systems biology. And on this slide you see here a whole variety of, uh, of, of networks at different levels uh, of analysis, transcriptional, genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, and so on. Um, and there are companies that um, 
that are doing this now. Um, one of the most interesting is a company in Seattle called um, Sage uh, Bionetworks that in fact is doing systems biology in the intervention context, uh, not only in, um, in uh, cardiovascular disorders, which is when most of this activity is taking place, but also, uh, for example, in schizophrenia using uh, large data sets uh, to develop multi-pronged network-based approaches uh, to prediction. Now, as we move into electronic medical records uh, full force, you can begin to think about scaling this process up so that it involves um, not tens of thousands of patients, but millions of patients all in databases. Um, one will no longer have to do double data entry, have uh, a lot of monitoring and all the kind of quality mechanisms that are required. Um, and with very large sample sizes, one will be able to develop precision um, not only um, uh, for subgroups of patients, but for individual, um, individual, uh, individual um, uh, patients. And in fact, one can imagine that the transition between, um, between um, uh, uh, stratified medicine, subgroup level analyses, and personalized medicine, individual prediction, um, will come with very large numbers of patients um, in randomized um, and observational uh, trials. Um, uh, uh, which can, um, within a biosignature uh, uh, systems biological approach, uh, develop very sophisticated uh, prediction al algorithms. So the more subjects and the more data, um, uh, the more likely it is we'll move from stratified um, to, um, to a personalized uh, medicine. And um, everybody agrees that it's going to be the electronic medical record um, that allows um, this to happen over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, ideally, what we would get to is context-based decision support. And this is an example um, from a small company called Mind MindLink, which makes a um, uh, EMR for um, uh, psychiatry uh, of a context decision uh, support algorithm um, that's both guidelines uh, and patient-based. This is an individual patient looking at, um, at uh, 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 this particular patient graphically at a treatment choice uh, for the treatment of, uh, of depression who's failed SSRIs and using um, all the other patients in the universe who look like or don't look like um, this uh, patient um, informs the choice of whether this patient should get bupropion or TCA augmentation or should go on um, to uh, ECT as the most likely treatment um, to have a high benefit um, to harms uh, ratio. Now, if we put all this together, we can see how medicine will evolve over the next um, 20 to 30 years. Right now, we're mostly at paper records. We use diagnosis by observation. Um, uh, uh, we treat symptoms um, with very little understanding of the functional, uh, uh, the fundamental biology of these uh, illnesses. Treatment is episodic um, and disease uh, oriented. As we move into the electronic medical record age, we'll develop the capability uh, to do biodiagnosis. We'll have much better biomarkers and, uh, and biosignatures, and these will uh, accompany target identification and the development of new treatments that um, intervene uh, either at the disease level, the program level, um, uh, probably not at the, um, at the uh, uh, risk factor level uh, to prevent, um, uh, to, uh, 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 to improve um, uh, the outcomes for patients by um, taking a, an off trajectory uh, illness and moving that patient back onto a normal uh, developmental trajectory. And ultimately, um, uh, uh, with large enough uh, sample sizes uh, and the ability to chain uh, risk factors uh, together in a systems uh, biological approach that includes um, uh, the uh, uh, environment, um, what's sometimes called from a genetic point of view systems genetics, uh, we'll move to um, personalized healthcare uh, where we have preemptive interventions on a lifetime trajectory and individualized uh, optimized interventions for the um, single individual delivered with context-based um, decision support. So this is the goal um, that we're now um, working toward, and all of it begins with translational developmental neuroscience. So if I had a heart attack, if I went like this and crumped over um, clutching my chest, uh, the Levine sign, um, you would immediately have me um, move to the Duke Heart Center, and the likelihood is pretty good if I didn't die in the way that I would have a good outcome. This would be my outcome if I had a, um, a psychotic illness, bipolar, severe bipolar disorder with schizophrenia. I'd be sleeping on a local um, sewer grate. This is unconscionable. Um, and it's only this way um, uh, because we don't have interventions which remove patients um, easily um, from here to here. When we do, 
um, we'll develop neuroscience hospitals in exactly the same way we now have heart centers um, and, uh, and cancer centers. And the sooner we do it, uh, the better for our patients. Um, and in fact, the Cancer Institute now has a motto, a world without cancer. And at some point in the future, I hope in the not too distant future, the NIMH will move um, so that its motto is a world without mental illness. For that to happen, we need the things that I have talked about. We need to think about preemption. We need to understand the fundamental biology of these illnesses from the point of view of translational developmental neuroscience. We need to move from stratified to personalized medicine, emphasizing um, biomarkers and biosignatures. We need to develop the infrastructure, particularly the early phase clinical pharmacology infrastructure that can speed the process of drug development for these um, uh, new uh, uh, in interventions. Um, and we need to also think about how we're going to move um, into a model where we're looking at thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of patients um, on um, very large uh, clinical uh, preemption trials um, and prag pragmatic trials so that we can, in fact, move uh, fully um, to personalized medicine uh, using context-based decision support. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, I'm near the end of my career now. I hope that I stay alive long enough to see this happen and perhaps even um, still uh, remain a part of it. Part of it. It's a tremendously um, exciting world. Uh, those of you that are students that are watching this presentation, there's no more exciting area of medicine um, than neurosciences medicine. And within neurosciences medicine, no more exciting uh, career um, than in, um, in psychiatry. It's changing rapidly. We haven't seen anything yet. Thank you.